Um, I am Jeff Cox. I'm the president of Alliant International University. And although this is a sad occasion, I am very pleased to welcome you to this event to honor the life and the career and the family of our friend and colleague, Herb Baker. Uh, for those of you who are visitors to Alliant, I, I offer you a special welcome to our campus and for the faculty and staff and students who are here. Uh, these are one of the reasons that uh, we uh, celebrate our community. One of the ways in which we celebrate our community is a, a people of common interests and, and common aspirations, and Herb represented that as much as anyone on this campus, and so it is good for us to be here today to, to celebrate that memory. I want to, before I begin talking about Herb a little bit, I want to acknowledge a few people who helped make this event possible just uh, to make sure that we thank them properly. Uh, Roshnu Kumar, Mike Pittenger, Monica Perea, Jay Finkelman, and Kathy Radcliffe, I understand, uh, did most of the organizing of this event, and so I want to express my gratitude to them. I also want to particularly thank uh, Herb Baker's family, who's uh, here up in the front row. Uh, his, his children uh, have been gracious enough to allow us as the Alliant community to uh, participate in this event with them uh, as the main memorial for Herb. Uh, we certainly feel that Herb was part of our family and so through him we feel very connected to you. I hope you accept our most sincere condolences on your loss and our gratitude for sharing Herb with us all of these years. Herb was a man of this university and particularly of this campus. Uh, he held a PhD from United States International University, which he earned in 1977. He joined our faculty in 1989. He served as a faculty member, as an administrator, as a program director, and as a leader, I think above all else, of programs that he cared deeply about. Uh, his uh, academic specialty was in organizational studies and he led that program through numerous changes over the years through mergers and name changes and various other disruptions to what he really cared most about which was the academic program, the students and the faculty. Herb, I think above all else to all of us here at the university represented standards of integrity, of devotion and commitment to students of loyalty to the faculty and the staff and a commitment to the highest academic standards of anyone in our community. And he, uh, no matter what relationship you had to him, those things came through loud and clear uh, above all else. When Herb's uh, sudden and untimely death was reported to our community, there was a sudden outpouring of of comments. Uh, uh, we live and die by email these days, of course, and so for a couple of days there were many, many people who volunteered memories and, and, and reminiscences of Herb. Lots of descriptions of him, most of them very colorful. The word crusty was used quite a bit. <laughs> but also the words big hearted, soft in the middle, generous to a fault. Uh, it was very clear that we all shared a very common impression of Herb as a man who was imposing and even sometimes intimidating uh, as, as, as large and as a great physical presence as he was, but nonetheless someone who everyone knew had a heart of gold and who extended himself and his time and talents and generosity uh, without ever having to be asked twice. My own memories of Herb date back to my, my early experiences as, as president here, uh, now dating back only about six years. I didn't know him as long as many people in this room, but again, he made an enormous impression. Uh, many of my conversations with Herb, he would take some pains to tell me about his disappointments with my predecessors. <laughs> and, you know, it was a pretty clear lesson that he hoped that I wouldn't fall into the wayward ways that they had. And it turned out uh, personally to be a good lesson for me. Uh, I often found myself kind of saying, well, would Herb approve? And if so, I knew that I was pretty much on the straight and narrow track. And if there was any doubt about it, it was uh, something to certainly think twice about. So I uh, have a special fondness for Herb, and his voice will, will stay with me as I continue to work at Alliance and remember how much he cared about this place and try to do that, uh, that, that loyalty justice. 
We have a long list of speakers today, people who want to share their personal reminiscences of Herb, and and it is the way of our community to allow that. So I'm going to leave now uh, uh, the podium, but uh, share with you once again my my own personal uh, uh, fondness for Herb and my gratitude for all he gave to this institution. And I know that I share with his family uh, a deep sense of loss. Thank you. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Dean of uh, Marshall Goldsmith School of Management, uh, Herb's Dean, uh, Dr. Jim Goodrich. Thank you, Jeff. Like Jeff, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. I think it's important that we honor the memory of people that were part of our family, part of our university community. This announcement came at about the time I was getting on a plane to go down to our Mexico City campus and it was just amazing to me I guess because Herb had his office next to mine and he was such a lively person and just before I left he had said as soon as I came back he wanted to go over an idea that he had with me and when could we get together. Uh, Herb had a lot of ideas and I must say that one of the things I valued about him is that he looked to the future always as well as the past. He did talk about our predecessors and my predecessors and indeed he was one of the first to greet me when I walked onto this campus and did this job two and a half years ago. Um, And at that very first meeting he wanted to outline his ideas for how we should revive our leadership PhD program in, in the management school. Uh, Herb had a great passion for ideas and he thought a lot before he talked. He didn't just start to speak. He would he would think about it and he would deliberate and then you knew when he said something it was something that he thought about quite a bit. And I like the care that he took in putting his ideas together and the way that he presented himself as well as the way that he presented the things that subject matter that he was talking about. He had as Jeff said, a big impact in this place and and in this university and obviously many of the facts of his life are are listed in this program here. Um, For me, in terms of my personal experience of him as Dean, I think that he was a unique individual. He had a a combination of personal charm and professional expertise that you do not always see. faculty member or an administrator or a leader. My father once told me that, son, it's better to be an architect than an engineer. The architect gets to design the thing so that it looks good and it's up to the engineer to build it out to spec and make sure that it works right as planned. And if anything goes wrong, they never blame the design, they just blame the engineer and the people that built it. As far as I can see, Herb uh, was one of those unique individuals that's both a good architect as well as an engineer. He was someone who could design things, conceptualize things, put things together, and yet still follow through on the details to get it done. And in my view, and I have been a professor and an administrator at four different universities in the last now almost 30 years, uh, that's a pretty unique combination. I've hired a lot of faculty, I've worked with a lot of administrators, and I would say that Herb was unique. He was was really one of a kind in that combination of ingredients. As Jeff says, he meant a lot to the school, and he was certainly a true pioneer of our program here, and all of the current and former students that are here today have felt his impact. He was a good teacher, and he really did teach the right stuff. He had the right ideas. I remember after I came here he invited me to teach in his in his leadership class and it was very clear to me that he was the type of person he didn't only feel the students learned from him he felt that they learned from others and he was always trying to bring in experts and connect students to other experts or other people that he knew uh, in the community or in the, the profession. I know that he very much wished the best for all of his students and he helped them a lot in other ways as you'll hear outside of the classroom as well as a teacher. We actually want to start a scholarship fund in his name at the Marshall Goldsmith School of Management and I think we'll get a good response to it 
it's an indication of the high regard that not only our current students but our alums, our graduates, uh, hold him as well as a sign of their success uh, as people that he taught and worked with over the years. To me that as a teacher, as a professor, as an administrator, as part of a university community, that's the most important uh, and most lasting uh, legacy that you can leave is the impact that you have on people and your contribution to preparing uh, them for success. Herb always did that and he will definitely be missed. I'll now introduce Roshna Kumar, our program director for business and management. Um, I'm Rachna Kumar, and um, I have known, I knew her for about 15 years, dating far back in the USIU days. Uh, for the past three years, I also had the distinct honor of um, having an office which was right across from him, only a few steps away, so I saw him all the time. And um, therefore, he will be much missed. Um, I did want to take a few minutes to set up the memorial service. Today we've uh, met here because uh, we want to celebrate memories of uh, Herb's life. This provides us with um, time and space, time to share memories and uh, a space to share in a community which cares for Herb's legacy. And um, in the past two weeks we've had an outpouring of uh, messages, of sentiments, of emotions and so many, so many things that we've heard from all over the world, from different people that he has touched, alumni, students, faculty, staff. So um, we want to take this time to share with this community different memories that we have. Uh, there is, there is, um, there is uh, several uh, people who want, do want to speak, and they are representing the different people, different groups of people who are here, the students, the alumni. After the ceremony, the formal part of the ceremony, we will also request people to come over with us towards the school, which is closer to Dr. Baker's um, office, and there will be more time to share more personally um, in, in smaller groups. I wanted to now introduce um, the San Diego Chorus, who is with us today. The San Diego Chorus is a women's cappella group. They have a 153-year um, uh, history in San Diego. Uh, Herb's daughter was part of this group, and Herb was very proud and, um, of this fact and always attended, tried to attend several of their, um, uh, several, several of their uh, ceremonies. They'll be, they'll be singing two pieces for us, Beautiful Savior and Sweet Hour of Prayer. So with that, I would like to start. Back home. 
Um, this annual chorus is here mainly to provide support and help to the faculty, uh, to the uh, family and the uh, friends of her. Uh, we must thank them very much because music has a way of healing. We have one more piece to be sung um, by them, and um, we can. It's later in the program, but maybe we can take it up right now. have um, Herb's family here, and we have two people who will speak on behalf of the family. Shmulek will speak first, and then Dr. Baker's uh, daughter, Caressa, will be speaking. Uh, um, I'm going to read this, and it's the one way I can get through this and get everything I wanted to say. Uh, we gather here today to honor a great man who has touched us all. He is known to some as Dad, Dr. Baker, Herb, Dr. B, and even Herbie. The first time I heard him mention he was called Herbie was during his speech to my graduating class. I nearly fell off my chair at the thought of this big man who is so strong, commands attention and respect by just his presence has a vulnerable and childlike side. I was lucky to have, have known him and to be able to call him a friend. In honoring him today, I wanted what I said to be perfect. I wanted it to be special. I wanted it to be unique. What I really wanted is, is, is it for it to bring him back. I couldn't admit to myself that a person who meant so much to so many people who was a pillar of strength and love was gone. I put off writing the eulogy for a few days until I got my usual nudge from Dr. Baker. Let me explain. I went to a birthday dinner at a Chinese restaurant the other day. After dinner, I received the customary fortune cookie, which said, you will be honored by someone you respected. At that moment, I broke down in tears because I realized nothing I could do or say would bring him back because he really never left. I was asked to say a few things about Herb 
on behalf of his family, Tanya Lee would always tell her dad that she could write a book about with the th- with the lessons that he taught her. She wishes to share some of these lessons she learned from him today. He taught me good manners. He taught me to allow grow. He taught me about loyalty. He taught me the extremely important concept of letting go. He taught me about commitment and to do what I say. He taught me to give thanks and gratitude. He taught me to love and appreciate mystery. He taught me how you excuse me, he taught me how you can always learn something new, never stop learning, never stop growing. He taught me to pursue the path of enlightenment. He taught me to make the most of my le- of my time. He taught me everything was important, and if it wasn't, it was important to be rid of it. He taught me how to uh, see all that is unseen. He taught me how to be affectionate. By loving me, he taught me how to love. He taught me how to live and how to die. His daughters and sons are very proud of their, their dad, his continued growth and personal development, rising up to his challenges. He never knew how to foster a relationship with his grandchildren, as he never had a grandfather himself. It was difficult, but with the help of his daughters, he would build a relationship with his grandchildren and was able and was a wonderful grandfather, passing on similar life lessons to his grandchildren. Carissa recalls growing up, his, her, uh, Herb was rambunctious, clever, sneaky, sly as a fox. He was curious and liked to solve problems, figuring out how things worked. One story that stands out is how he used to look into his godmother's jewelry box, see what was in it, and play with the sh- its shiny trinkets. To put a stop to this regular invasion, one day his godmother put a lock on the box. With this, what did Herb do? In a bold move, he decided to gum up that, the works of the lock and put putty inside of it. He was determined that if he couldn't enjoy the contents of the jewelry box, no one was going to. <laughs> Perhaps not a surprising, surprisingly, Herb still holds the record for the most time spent in the principal's office in his high school. <laughs> I know, it's a shocker. (laughs) Herb liked to test limits and push them to their breaking point. This is obvious in his professional life, but it is also evident in his personal life. His his children tell of an early road trip trip where he and them ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere. They needed gas and had precious few options. When looking for a solution, they saw a lonely tractor in a nearby field after borrowing the gas without permission, they left the money to cover, to cover it on the tractor and continued on their way. Herb, as always, he would never be worried, always confident, knowing once he set his mind to, to his goal, he would, su- uh, he would see it to completion. He was very close to his sons, especially Herbert James Baker. If you look at H.J., you see a carbon copy of his dad. You see Dr. Baker and all the people he touched in his life. He has left his mark on all of us. His other love, the love of artifacts, started at an early age. When he was just 10 years old, he hitched hike from Indiana to Chicago to the Field Museum. Once inside, he actually hid until the museum was closed and then explored it, having his own night at the museum. (laughs) Along with his love of artifact came a sport, the sport of collecting them. He liked to buy and collect. It was a sport to shop, get the best price, and uh, and to get others to buy too. When he was nine years old, he saw pictures of the Anastasi ruins and he always wanted to explore them and years later he was finally able to. It was a special blessing. As the trip was being planned it was evident when pieces fell into place that it was meant for him. 
However, Tanya had to first make him believe that the whole endeavor was his idea. Her baker had a gift to see you for who you are, see your potential, and to nudge you in the direction you should go, whether you knew it or not. He was a great man who touched many lives and whose memory will live forever in all who know him. He inspired and motivated many of us. I feel lucky to have known him. My first real memory of interaction with Dr. Baker is when he hired me to be his research assistant five years ago. He would say jump and I would jump. He would ask me a question I would answer with yes sir. One day during the fall semester we were working on a research study. Time was not on our side for collecting the data. We needed to uh, complete their study. We had enrolled 68 people and needed 60 more. He found a class that had six people and was adamant that I survey that class. I was unable to do so and told him so. Dr. Baker didn't like to be told no. He responded, Jesus Christ, the survey needs to be done. Exasperated. I replied, Jesus Christ was crucified and can't help you. If you really want the survey to be done, find someone else to do, someone, find someone else. I told you I couldn't, I told you I couldn't do it. With a stern glare, I realized what I just said and quickly said sorry. For I believed I had disrespected him. However, he respected me for standing up to him and using humor to do so. From that point on, he was Dr. B to me and not just a program director but also a friend uh, and a friendship I have a high honor to share with you today. Herb Baker was a dedicated colleague and a friend. He was part of, part of the online community for more than 20 years. He was a former Marine who earned a silver star for composure and bravery in battle and a Purple Heart. During one of his tours to Vietnam, he took command of his troops when the commander at the time was unable. Herb single-handedly saved the lives of many troops and quickly, with quick thinking and bravery. After his first tour, he volunteered to go back for a second, never, never wanting to leave any job unfinished. After leaving the Marine Corps, he attended USI, USIU and received his doctorate in 1997. 1977. Oof, sorry. <laughs> he then joined his faculty in 1989, rising, rising to the ranks from teacher to program director of the Marshall Goldsmith School of Management. Dr. Baker understood commitment. He understood you couldn't be somewhat or halfway committed. If he committed to something, he committed to, do, to it, and he saw it to, through to the end. After all, he was a Marine. Rain or shine, Herb was a dependable store. Sto once, he, once he put his mind to something, or gave his word, he would honor it. He was a tree for many people, branches and leaves would move in the wind, but a herb stood firmly in the ground on his values and what he was here for. He provided protection and shade. Herb was committed to a line, which can be seen in his actions and all of our faces, and the fact we are all here today to pay homage. He gave of himself tirelessly on behalf of his students and his faculty who were his extended family, the welfare of his students and the integrity of the program of which he was a part of meant everything to him. He was known by the faculty and staff as a warm and dedicated man. A colleague and friend, Dr. Mike Pittenger, may have said it best when he wrote, Herb Baker, a big smile, a big voice, a big man, husband and father, teacher and scholar, leader, traveler, artist, marine, determined, outspoken, caring, funny, and a lot more, whom from the beginning had big expectations for us as an institution, 
as a campus com community and as a place where students could learn and be nourished. In closing, continuing with what Mike said, your passing makes me want to hold tight and keep alive the most special lessons you taught about caring for this place, about supporting our students, a bright memorial to you as your friend and colleagues will be our increased dedication to these values that were so important to you. For me, I would like to add to continue the lesson he taught us in the community we live in and with new people we, whom we come in contact. Remember to show respect and honor others as well as yourself. Don't be attached to only material objects but deeper connections to the world around you and the ground you walk on, the air you breathe. Appreciate life you have and how to live it and when it is time to let go and how to say goodbye. Even though life for those who love him and miss him doesn't seem the same or stable without him in it, Dr. Baker would say that security is within you, within us, and it comes from us. Thank you. This is from my brother H.J., my father's son, who wasn't he wasn't able to be here today, but it was very important that this is read for him. The light of your consciousness shines with intensity as a beacon to others on the quest for truth and knowledge. Your aspirations give ultimate insight into and for the keys to achievement. You were, you are, that solid structure, structure that people naturally gravitate towards. A base of pervading actuality, a source of wisdom, and reliability which people could depend on always. You lead by the purest example. You're striving for the betterment of humanity and even for an individual's personal upliftment was always apparent and exhibited without effort. Your essence was the teacher, but you taught more than academic intelligence and application. You assisted many people in realizing their potential to succeed and reach ever progressive goals by encouraging them to exceed all perceived limitations. Do never argue for what can't be done and to learn by teaching others. You shape the new world by teaching and enlightening not only your students but also all those around you by instilling the aspects of expanding consciousness and by the active upliftment of spirit. Verily you were, you are, the embodiment of honor, principle, and morality unwavering. Your word was solid and dependable was a solid and dependable fact. Your steadfast determination to achieve and to see things through was insurmountable in the face of any adversity. You possessed emotional resiliency and moral strength unbeknownst to this world, yet you promoted and instilled this in others, and your legacy lives on. The work, worth ethics you instilled work will carry many people to a new and exciting domain of possibilities. I wish I was as good a speaker as my father. <laughs> you transcended the mundane and the triviality by concentration with drive and focus unparalleled. Yet your empathy and compassion was felt and experienced by everyone. Your ability to sacrifice for the greater good, for the good of others, is a treasured quality of selflessness we all wish we had. Your understanding of community and your application of co-measurement was and is a manifestation of the meaning of life, mutual evolution, expanding consciousness, and enlightenment, enlightenment to all. You taught beauty and renaissance. You actively taught harmony. Your genuine concern for others was unquestionable and thus people hearken. When you speak, taking your words to heart without second thought. Verily your words are vastly renowned, reflecting wisdom and stability, thereby possessing the rarest quality of affirmation. Yet beyond what can be said, it is what you did that defined your character. But still your words, 
be them spoken or written, hold more value than gold. Your words were the closest thing to action, for what you said was always done, always. Dad, you showed me, you gave me, loyalty supreme. Your devotion as a father only ever increased with time, and despite all strife or any hardship, your caliber of fatherhood cannot be fathomed. You were there for me every time, in all ways, no matter what. You never wavered or faltered in the slightest way, and you never lost faith in me. Your belief in me gave me unique courage and always will. Studying the culmination of your life's achievements, one arrives at a touching testimony to the power of human will, of true aspiration. It's a lesson I will never forget. You showed me how to live, who to be, and taught me right from wrong. You, kn you now live on through me. For now shall I rage onward and upward, carrying the torch you have passed to me. You may now be beyond the physical realm, but you are not gone. All I need to do to find you, Dad, is to look in the mirror. You are with me, and I with you. So many things I wish to say, but I'll close with this ode to you. Dad, the indestructible icon of your childhood and the closest link to yourself as you grow up. Though ever-changing times may be in a constant flux, a father's love, support, and loyalty remains unfazed and never corruptible. There are no substitutions for dad, nor anything or anyone that could ever take a father's place. He is the one dependable fact in life, the reliable source, who has the all-encompassing possession of absolute trust. Dad, the complex and unique relationship between father and son may never be fully understood. More importantly, you are a model for excellence in the field of fatherhood. Know you the truth, the great truth, of the everlasting bonds between father and son. I love you, Dad. There were so many lives and so many people that um, Herb touched and so many memories to share. Um, I have several groups from within the university as well who want to share their memories. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. J. Finkelman to share memories about her as a faculty. It's, uh, it's an honor to speak on behalf of Herb, on behalf of his colleagues. Kind of interesting as I was listening to the, the prior descriptions, uh, I I knew Herb for eight years. I, I supervised him for four years, but as well as you know, it's not possible to supervise Herb. Uh, my first instinct, similar to Schmulich's remark, is to call him Sir no matter what. Uh, although if I knew about the Herbie part, I could have nailed him on that point, but I, I never did uh, at the time. It's really a tribute to, to Herb. Some of the, the honors and accolades uh, we did not know about, I did not know about until we were looking for biographical information. In all my visits to the San Diego campus where I'd get together for dinner with Herb uh, and he would talk about the Marine Corps and all the stories and, and the significance of the, the uniforms and the swagger sticks, he never mentioned anything about his own accommodations and silver stars, not ever. And the, the uh, respect that I have for him is a function of the many demands he made on all of us at the university were never on behalf of him. They were always on behalf of students and colleagues. Rather extraordinary. I can't add value to the eloquent comments that students and staff and colleagues made when that first terrible email was circulated, so what I'll do instead is read some of them that are poignant and well-crafted and kind of interesting that the, uh, the uh, th a word search revealed that uh, warmth, sweetness, and crusty were the most common email descriptions about her. 
from Adriana Kleiman, uh, who works with me. I miss Dr. Baper, one of the warmest and most thoughtful people who is always ahead of the game and there with all the answers. From Nicolette in San Francisco, oh, I will miss Herb. I have a lump in my throat just thinking about it. He was a sweet, crusty man and very level-headed in a crisis. He would always drop by my office, even when there was nothing for him to gain politically by doing so, and always ask whether I had been painting. He knew how to stop and smell the roses, and, and this turns out to be absolutely accurate. What people didn't know about Herb is his level of intellectual curiosity was extraordinary. We know him from some of the other qualities, but he was always interested in why things did what they did and how things worked in the world. To Pizzi, who will speak shortly, uh, I'm devastated at the loss of my mentor. Dr. Baker was an amazing man, a true advocate, a real leader. My head is full of all the little moments we shared. How can he possibly be gone? From Mary Fanbro in San Francisco, I'm shocked at the news and of course very sad. We lost a valued colleague who I will remember for his dedication, the high quality standards, speaking his mind even if his opinion wasn't popular and supporting what he believed was right. Herb had an enormous heart under a sometimes brusque exterior and had, I had a huge amount of affection for him. Scott Woolley, this is shocking news. I've known Herb for 14 years and found him crusty on the outside but very tender hearted and caring on the inside. When it came to expressing his opinions or standing up for what he believed, he had incredible strength, a steel spine. Erwin Rosenfarb, I loved his passion for life, his big heart, and his integrity. Something that hasn't been mentioned yet is that he was the chair of the USIU Faculty Senate at the time of the merger. He was instrumental in smoothing the transition and calming all of our ruffled feathers. He was level-headed at a time when many of us were fraught with emotion. He will be missed. Rodney Lohman. He was inordinately persistent. If you wanted to reach you, you might find seven or eight missed call messages on your phone if you were not available right when he wanted you. And good luck if you tried to avoid him when he wanted to address or confront some issue. He'd track you down like a bloodhound. That is so true. <laughs> Just about everyone has mentioned the shock at Herb's passing. This is still from Rodney's email. If you have to go, as we all do, dying in your sleep, as Herb apparently did, is not a bad way to do it. And he died as he would have wanted with his boots on, having worked at the office that day, the last Sunday. For us, the collective survivors, though, we would have wanted a little more time with Herb, a little more leisurely letting go, and his sudden absence creates a hole as large as his frame and personality. Closing comments from a, uh, an eloquent email that Mike Pittenger wrote, parts of which Mueller quoted, I won't repeat them, but it kind of gives you the background both to the remarks and to our feelings about Herb. In the summer of 2000, an alumna known for her clinical acumen and conspiracy theories dropped by my office at the CSPP San Diego Cornerstone campus to check out a rumor she had heard that CSPP and USIU were going to merge. My almost instant response, based mostly on ego, was, when pigs fly. <laughs> Two months later, I was driving onto the USIU campus with a CFO of CSPP who was visiting from San Francisco. For a surreptitious look at the campus with which we were apparently determined to combine. After surveying the grounds in our baseball caps and dark glasses, we parked, walked along Academic Way, and randomly rolled into Daly Hall. As we skulked along the first corridor like a couple of kids sneaking into a baseball game, the only person in evidence was this big guy in a striped shirt and a tie and plaid jacket, probably the only person on the campus with whom I had prior association. Busted! <laughs> As we exchanged glances and nods, I wanted to keep walking away from that rather unfortunate meeting and back to the parking lot where I knew I would be sure to see that squadron of pigs fixing to strafe the campus. <laughs> so Herb, when I think about you no longer bringing all of this to the campus every day and being physically part of our community, I certainly feel our loss and our grief. 
but there is more to it for me. Your passing makes me want to hold tight and keep alive the most special lessons you taught about caring for this place and about supporting our students. A bright memorial to you as our friend and colleague will be our increased dedication to these values that were so important to you. Rest in peace. Well, a group of people who shared many, many hours with um, her, the faculty, uh, Dr. Jordan Cantor will uh, represent and speak on that behalf. Herbert George Baker almost sounds like the royalty, right? <laughs> it, it, it brings up an emotion in anyone who knew her. Uh, my first exposure to her was about uh, 20 some years ago at the NPRDC and uh, uh, we had a, a monthly meeting of about 300 scientists and we went into a room and everybody was scrambling for the back row seats and her was sitting on the front row and sometimes by himself you know so I asked him once you know I said what's happening he said if you want something to be done you have to be seen and that, that was his attitude and, and the things he has done is you know he, he was good at getting things done and uh, he was one of the most prolific uh, technical report writer at the NPRDC and uh, he ran the I.O. programs both at USIU and at Alliant with the same enthusiasm and same determination and uh, he was not shy to delegate uh, duties and uh, if, if you were hesitant about accepting them, he says, well you have done me a favor before, so I have the right to ask you again. <laughs> he, he also used his body as a motivator, you know, he stood over you and, and, and you really couldn't say no you know, at that point. And, and matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago uh, at, at one of the meetings, um, one of the faculty members offered him a chair and he says, I look more imposing if I'm standing. <laughs> so, so, so he really was proud of his, his body as, as of his mind. Uh, he also infuriated some people when he stood over someone and said, Steve, you are developing a boarding spot. <laughs> now, he was, you know, he was asking you favors, but he also returned them. And, and he was very good at helping others to accomplish things and, uh, and, and excel in whatever they were doing. And his door was always open, and even if he was in a bad mood, you know, after the grumbling died, you know, he was ready to help. Okay, and, and if he didn't know the answer, he uh, picked up the phone and says, Jay, John Cantor is in my office, and, he, and then he goes on and on, and then he got the answer right then and there, you know, what, what, what I was looking for. So, so, so he was uh, really a helpful individual. He never had to look up the phone number, you know, he always knew some all the phone numbers. I, th I think he knew more phone numbers than the, uh, the, the editor of the uh, Yellow Pages. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, at, at one time I went into his office uh, just a couple of minutes late for a meeting and, and he said that, uh, <clears throat> so I use the excuse, you know, that my, my watch is slow. So, so, <laughs> so he says, why don't you call 619-759 or whatever. <laughs> And, and tell him that Herb sent you and he will fix you up with a good watch. <laughs> good. All right. So, so his, his dedication to the students was just as, as good you know, as, as to the faculty. And uh, he hugged them, he traveled with them, he parted with them, and, and those students who are around, you know, they, they know that. And he was very particular when he was hiring new faculty. You know, the one question he always asked, are you going to love our students? And, and that, was, that was his way of uh, selecting the right person who will fit into the community and, and so on. And uh, so that was her, a no-nonsense, get it done, no matter what type of individual. 
and, and his colorful personality will be missed throughout the university. Uh, in the name of the organizational psychology fac faculty, I could say that it was a privilege to know him, and, and he enriched everybody's lives. And knowing a little bit about him and about what he believed in, he's probably traveling in the universe looking for new challenges. <laughs> God bless you, and happy traveling. Well, we all know that Herb was very dedicated to work, but really it was all directed towards dedication to students because students is who he loved. So next we have Kopitsi Thornton and uh, Ingrid Wilson speaking on behalf of the students. I thought what I was going to write was so unique, but um, I think you're going to hear a lot of uh, echoed remarks. Um, I remember calling the school for the first time, and on the other end of this line was this really big voice. Um, what can I do for you? And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I want to come to school there. And um, a few days later, I was in his office and being interviewed for the program, and I was terrified and hoping he'd let me in. and kind of pushed a hot button with me and um, I spit back some smart remark and then I thought I just said something I shouldn't have said to the man who has the power to decide my future and uh, when I looked up at him he was smiling at me like that and then um, I realized I passed a test so for the past seven years Dr. Baker's been my advisor and my mentor and in my experience, no one supported and advocated for students in our programs like he did. In the past few weeks, we've all been coming together and sharing our Baker stories. And I realized that he was really all about the special moments. Quiet, one-on-one -on -one, uh, moments where he taught life lessons in really precise and poignant kind of phrases. He told a friend of mine who just experienced a, a breakup, he says, why are you sad? Life's just beginning for you. Uh, I can picture him walking toward me now, like he'd done many times, and said, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And he usually said that to me right before he had something he wanted me to do for him. <laughs> he also told me once when I was doubting whether or not to voice an unpopular opinion, uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. And uh, listening to some of those stories, that has some deeper meaning than it ever did before. So moment to moment, Dr. Baker supported us in these ways. In these messages, he let me know that I'd earned his respect. He also nudged me to be the person I should be. What a gift. To me, to us to all the people across the years. A lot of us in the Facebook and in the community have been asking how we're supposed to move forward without it. And it's going to be really difficult, but I think the best way to honor him is to complete what we started together and to remember the lessons he taught us. Dr. Baker was well-loved and well-respected and for good reason. And in honor of his leadership, in his service to country and its incomparable devotion to the Alliant community. I have flags that were flown over the United States Capitol in his honor. One for the Alliant and one for his family. Thank you. So I'm starting to notice a pattern here with the students uh, that worked with Dr. Baker and it was um, <clears throat> fighting. <laughs> so just as in pie, sometimes the crust is what you love the most. Um, I really don't have a lot of words to 
describe Dr. Baker, but I have stories. And one of the stories is the first time I met Dr. Baker, um, I flew down from Hawaii to see if I wanted to go to this school. And I was introduced to this behemoth, intimidating man. And I thought, okay. Um, and the first thing I, he said to me when I walked into the room was, where's your file? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Am I supposed to have my file? And he advised me, well, I guess I'm just going to have to wing it. So I said, okay, here we go. So after some time of talking, the last thing he said to me was, there's one thing we ask of our students at this school. And I thought, shit. <laughs> I didn't study. I don't know any IO theories. I don't know any IO theorists yet. So I looked at him and I said, okay. And he says to me, do they look like one of us? And my jaw dropped. <laughs> I looked him up and down, and I looked myself up and down. And I thought, I look nothing like you. <laughs> and he said, I think you do. Welcome to the program. <laughs> and I said, thank you so much. I, I, I just can't, I don't know what to say. Can I get that in writing? <laughs> so that was my first meeting with Dr. Baker. For the next five years, he was a mentor, a boss, and mostly a friend. I never took a class with Dr. Baker, and it's not because I thought he was mean or I was too scared to. It was because I was so afraid that if I wrote a paper, <laughs> he would think, my God, Ingrid's an idiot. <laughs> And so I thought, I didn't, and he would think, I've been putting my reputation on the line for this person by writing them letters of recommendation and, and telling people about this person. So I thought, I, I could never take a class with him because I knew I couldn't disappoint him. And if I ever disappointed him, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Dr. Baker, uh, um, would do anything for anybody. And a lot of times I would say, Dr. Baker, there's this class that I really want to take and I need to take, but it's not offered this semester. And before I could even finish, he was whipping out a cell phone calling somebody. And I thought, let me finish. You know, what's, what's so important? And it would be, Dr. Nairn, I got a student, you're doing an independent study. And I just thought, wow, this guy's definitely the man to be friends with. So, um, he was, he was never a professor. I could never call him a professor, but he was a friend. Um, I loved his sense of humor most and his abrasive brashness. Um, if people would just listen to what he had to say instead of just nodding in submissive agreement, the man was actually a ham. He would always ask me about Joe. And I would look at him and I said, who's Joe? And he would say, how's Joe doing? I said, Dr. Baker, I don't know a Joe. <laughs> and with that grin, he would say, Joe Mama. <laughs> and people don't believe me when I tell them that story, but I swear to God it's true. <laughs> he met my mom when we were on a study tour to China. And when we got to the Great Wall of China, he was hell-bent on making it to the top. And it was a hot and muggy day, muggy day in China. And as we're going up, I think there's maybe 16 of us in the group. And people were peeling off right and left. And I thought, you know what? Somebody's got to make it to the top with this guy. He's a big man. And if he faints and comes tumbling down, <laughs> he's going to take a lot of Chinese tourists out. <laughs> so I managed to fall him all the way to the top. And he would sway sometimes, and I was so scared because I thought, I can't hold him. I can't catch him. But we made it to the top, and then I was afraid that the study tour shuttle was going to leave us. So I said, Dr. Baker, should we head, should we head down? He says, screw them. They'll wait for us. <laughs> I thought, they're going to wait for us. So we spent a spectacular moment at the top of the Great Wall of China, um, and it was great. Um... I wasn't able to see a whole lot of him the last couple of years. 
and that was hard. But I blame him because he's the one that gave me the excellent letters of recommendation and pointed me the right direction for jobs that I didn't think I could achieve until years after my doctorate. So it's his fault. But every time I was on campus, I made sure to stop by his office or sometimes I would sneak into Monica's office hoping he wouldn't see me, but only because I only had like five minutes and I knew I wouldn't be able to spend just five minutes with a man. But then I didn't care. I figured I had to get an excuse and if anybody would say my butt, it would be Dr. Baker. <laughs> so um, one of the hardest things I heard was when I talked to my dad and I called him and told him that Dr. Baker's passing. We haven't had the best relationship in the last 10 years. So when my dad said to me, I know he was like a father to you, it hurt. <laughs> so the last thing I want to say is something that Dr. Baker and I agreed on, and it was a cotton, it was a philosophy that I don't know if it was Confucius or John Wayne. <laughs> but, um, he said, sometimes people need a swift kick in the ass versus a pat on the back. And what I have to say about that is, okay, Dr. Baker, you can stop kicking. <laughs> My ass is small because he kicked it so often. <laughs> I uh, heard Dr. Baker's voice many times as I prepared my remarks, saying, keep it short, Mark, so I will attempt to do that. I will do that. <laughs> my first experience with Dr. Baker as a student was watching him dress down um, someone who was trying to get credits to transfer into USIU. Uh, the student, uh, the, the student, the person who wanted to become a student asked, well, does this, would this transfer? Dr. Baker said, no. <laughs> would this transfer? No. Would this transfer? No. Well, um, the, the, the outside, the, the outshot of that was that the, none of the credits transferred, but yet Dr. Baker showed that he was going to have patience enough to win this person to the conclusion that these credits are not going to transfer even though Dr. Baker told him the first time none of them, none of them would transfer even if he clicked down the list of each one of these, these courses that he had taken. As a student in Dr. Baker's classes, um, he was able to evoke emotion. Um, he made me mad one time. Uh, he called Christy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he called um, called Christianity a myth. <laughs> and I said, How dare he do that? So I, I went home and I looked up the definition of myth. And doggone it, if Christianity doesn't fit within that definition, it was it was. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, proposed by Webster or whatever uh, dictionary I, I looked it up in. So we never really addressed that. I knew that he had done his homework, and and uh, and that made that made his point. He also shared a respect and allowed his students to gain a respect of the authors that we read about. Um, he told us about Simlog and was a disciple of Simlog. I never met Freed Bales, but when I met Herb at Freed Bales' memorial, I was able to go up to Herb and say that even though I had not met Dr. Bales, I felt as though I was representing all those people that had been touched 
by his theories and had used them consistently over and over again. And it wasn't just Dr. Bales that was um, impressed upon me in Dr. Baker's classes, but it was all the other theorists that we studied. I remember when I was studying for my, when I, when I was preparing my dissertation, his memory was amazing. Off the top of his head, he said, organizational commitment, look up Maglino and Medina. I think it was 1984, something like that. And sure enough, that's exactly the reference that I, that I needed. He would speak to you as though he had little patience. But he would act with the utmost support for each one of uh, for each one of you. <clears throat> Excuse me. He encouraged me, and I'm sure many others, to publish the research, which was done at his encouragement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, thank you. He taught his students to be forward-looking, as he was, as Dr. Goodrich mentioned. Very quickly, I'd like for the former students of his classes, the alumni of our program, just to shoot your hand up. Could you do that for me? Thank you. I would say to Dr. Finkelman, Dr. Goodrich, forward-looking as he's taught us to be, we're not sure how you can replace Dr. Baker. We know that he would agree that he is not the irreplaceable faculty member, but yet we know how much he supported us over the years. So each one of those hands raised represents countless others who pledge our support in helping this university go forward and whoever takes Dr. Baker's place, we pledge our support to him right now. To his family. I just want to say on the behalf of all of us that we thank you so much for sharing him with us. And with that, I will close by saying, I kept it short, Herb. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, there were so very many memories that were shared today by us, and so very many more memories, and it has bring, brought her more to life for me today. Um, than, than ever before. Um, I like to say that he, um, her was one person that I never, never got to shake hands with because he always said, you're too far down, and he would plant a kick on my head. <laughs> but in closing, I do want to say that um, I'd like to leave you with um, a vision that, uh, that I have um, for her. And, um, you know, he had a very unexpected smile, and, it, and the smile lit his face and every corner of his face. And the pictures that we chose, the couple of pictures that we have chosen, are actually representing that smile. And that's the face that I will remember, because of, um, behind all his sternness and all his um, um, austere words, he would break out into a smile, and that's the face that would, that would be left with me, and that's what I'll remember him as. Um, the formal part of the ceremony is uh, coming to an end now. We have some refreshments here, but we'll invite um, everyone to come with us to the Marshall Goldsmith School of Management. Her Baker's um, office is right there as well. And we thought it would be nice for those of you who have time to come with us and come, come with us there. And there are some refreshments there, and we'll get a chance to share some of our personal memories in smaller personal groups. I also wanted to mention that there are some um, notes here for those of us who want to write something and leave behind. We'll be collecting that. And um, 
sharing it with the family as well as keeping it uh, keeping it with us because there are so very many groups that want to keep a piece of um, those memories. So with that, I'll thank you all for coming. And uh, some of us will start walking towards the school. So uh, if you have time to stay, and we'd love to have you share our time there as well. Thank you.